Friend, you might have seen stories the last few days and uh, the video clips, and everyone has a phone and they can take the, the footage just so easy now, of uh, orcas, particularly in Wellington Harbour, but um, all around the place, really. And uh, I, I noticed that uh, the comments that go along with them is, yeah, they're, they're going for the stingrays. And that's what I always thought. But I, I thought, well, are they? Really? Or is that just, you know... You, you'll, you'll believe that so easily. Maybe there are other things they're after. And I got curious about orcas, so I thought we'd try and chat to someone who knows a bit about them. And Ingrid Visser is from the Orca Research Trust, and she joins us. Hi, Ingrid. Thanks for being on the platform. Oh, it's a pleasure. Any excuse to talk about orca. Oh, yeah. Well, um, the beautiful, beautiful creatures, aren't they? Yeah. Just, uh, just amazing. Yeah. Yeah, mesmerising. I mean, I've been studying the New Zealand orca for more than 30 years now and I still get a buzz when I see them. Okay, tell me, are they as smart as humans? Well, it depends which human you're talking to really, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, me. <laughs> well, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously yeah, they don't have the ability smart. to express intelligence in the way that we would because we're in a different world and a different reality. Right. But, you know, right. they've got right. huge brains... They live for yeah. a long time. They live. Uh, oh, they have yeah. social order and all that sort of stuff, um, and, oh, yeah. and and they must build up all sorts of memories. Um, if, well, they live what Absolutely. seventy, eighty years um, as they travel yeah. uh, travel huge distances. They got to pick up yeah. some smarts along the way somewhere. Oh, ab absolutely. I mean, and think about this. They've got to be smart enough to catch dolphins and everybody knows how smart dolphins are. So, right. you know, that gives them another layer up there, right? So, yeah, they're, they're, they are really super smart, for sure. Okay, so joking <laughs> we see them. They come into Wellington Harbour. I, I'm only talking about yeah. that because that, that's <coughs> the one I saw and, I, and I've seen them in, in the harbour before because I've been around the city for oh. a long time. And uh, um, first of all, what would make them want to come into a place like a harbour, and surely there's more, more food out there in the big wide ocean. Uh, yes and no. I mean, the thing with orca is that they also have culture. So depending on where they live, they have specific culture, and it's it's very similar to humans. You know, like we have cultures. Some people prefer to eat rice, and some people prefer to eat potatoes. Same thing happens with orca, not rice and potatoes, but in this case, it, it might be dolphins or stingrays or salmon. And so which culture you grow up in is ah. what influences you. Yeah, and so here in New Zealand, the culture, we've, we've got two main cultures that we see, one that feeds predominantly on um, marine mammals, mostly on uh, dolphins, and then another one that feeds on fishes, mostly on sharks and rays. And that's the one that's pre predominantly comes into the Wellington Harbour. And so, yes, you're right, they are coming in there to feed on rays, and I was actually the first person to discover that. Oh, wow, you're the person. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, um, I also wonder, because I know that they can cover vast distances and, and you're talking about cultures now, and obviously we're talking about, what, some sort of local, in a way, culture. Yeah, well, How far do they, yeah, they, they, do, do they mm -hmm. range, the ones in this part of the well, world? Well, again, it depends on culture. Uh, so there are some orca that we've documented that have travelled from Antarctica and the Ross Sea, so south of us, all the way up past New Zealand and up to the Kermadec Islands. Uh, and then others, for example, on the other coast of Antarctica, on the uh, east coast of South America, they've travelled all the way up uh, from Antarctica to Brazil. So, wow. you know, you've got some, yeah, some that are travelling huge distances and then others that stay around New Zealand. So the New Zealand orca, um, they've never been documented outside of New Zealand waters. It doesn't mean that they're not going there. It just means we haven't got the data to show that they're not going anywhere else yet. So but after 30 years, you'd think yep. you'd find something, right? Well, yeah. you would, yeah. So that's, that's interesting. But they, I take it they have the physical ability to basically go anywhere yeah. that they would choose on, on, on the face of the earth, I yeah. would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, New Zealand is the only place in the world that we know of where they also go right up the rivers and go into mangrove areas. Oh, wow. So, you know, they don't always get um, in this ideal, you know, people think of them being way offshore or here in New Zealand close into the coast. But yes, they do go right up inside the harbours as well, which is, and when they're going up in there, they're hunting for sharks and for rays. I have seen them uh, because I lived on a hill in Wellington looking over the harbour and every now and then I'd hear them slapping their their tails, I guess, uh, on the water. Okay. 
and I've actually uh -huh. got, I've filmed one of them doing that. But I noticed that they were sort of laid out in a pattern. Do they obviously they got techniques for hunting and herding up their prey? Am I right? Oh yeah, oh absolutely. And the New Zealand orca has some spectacular hunting methods. So I've documented them. It was the first time that was documented as well. Was them using their tails like uh, karate chopping to hit the sharks and stun them. Uh, we've seen them flick the stingrays in the air with their tails like uh, tennis. And uh, they'll, wow. they'll use stealth mode where they'll come up um, in front of a group of dolphins. They'll dive down really deep, some of the individuals. And then the others behind the dolphin group make this scary noise and the dolphins stampede over the top of the one that's in front who then comes thundering up from the deep and knocks the dolphin into the air. So, you know, there's some really amazing stuff that goes on with them hunting here in New Zealand. Yeah, and um, I've heard also that they're not necessarily interested in human beings when they come up close, which surprises me because you, you just think that would be another opportunity for lunch or dinner or a <laughs> snack. Yeah. Um, why yeah. do, what, is that is that a you know true or is that something we sort of a story we've made up for ourselves? Well, it's a little bit of both. <laughs> um, so they've definitely killed people, but in captivity. Uh, so places like SeaWorld and uh, you know you can't blame the animals because they're just in such horrific conditions in those concrete tanks and, and they just you know they just break. Well I remember and, the, the and woman yeah. at SeaWorld who um, I was reading an article yeah, about yeah, her yeah, recently yeah. which is terribly yeah. sad but I got the left with the impression that somehow that orca was pretty angry about its situation and expressed that. Is that, oh, is that what they do? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And then there's over a um, hundred records in the documentation from the aquariums of orca attacking humans. And those are just the ones that get recorded. And typically they only get recorded when there's a show going on because the public have seen it, right? So there's lots of events that happen that just don't make it into the, into the log books. But yeah. in the wild, there's no verified attack of them having a go at people. But, you know, we have to be smart about it as well. You know, we need to be... Um, aware that these are top predators and that, you know, people don't understand how to interpret behaviours. And, you know, there, there could easily be a mistake that an animal makes um, because a human makes a mistake. So we know we need to be really careful and smart about it. And so the New Zealand government has said that there is no swimming with orca in New Zealand waters. It's against right. the law. Yeah, and that's oh. to protect the animals as much as it is to protect the people because, like I said, there's no records anywhere in the world of them attacking humans in the wild. Pre presumably they have capabilities that can sort of interrogate the, the food um, options. So they can see how much fat's on certain animals and, oh, yeah. and they make a sort of like yeah. a, a calorie decision, I guess, on is this worth the, <laughs> worth the effort no. to catch and eat if no. I'm going to get a return of the energy from, from the effort? No, no, no. I don't believe that's how it's working at all. I think from having watched them often enough, I believe that it's more to do with culture because you will see orca swim past a really fat seal here in New Zealand and they take no notice of it and the seal doesn't react either. So it's not like mm. um, you know, the prey actually when something's going to go wrong, they usually understand that as well because their life is on the line. So if, I mean, you must have seen the video footage where the orca come up on the beach in Argentina and grab the sea lion. Yeah. Right, so I study the orca over there as well, and you've only got to have an orca pass 100 metres off the beach, and all the sea lions are sitting up watching. Even though they're safe, they are watching what's going on. But here in New Zealand, you'll get the seals, and they'll actually just swim around the orca. They just don't care, So because they're not on the menu. And that's because of culture. Again, the, the seals are fat and healthy, and they could be taken, but the orca are like, well, look, I just don't eat seals. I'm, I'm a, um, you know a shark eater or a, a dolphin eater, and I just don't eat seals. That's really interesting. So in terms of that culture and um, how it's maintained, obviously there are, what, politics in the group, um, in the pod. Um, I, I've seen those uh, orcas with the big floppy fin. I've always wondered, um, what does that mean? Is that is that a health issue for the, for the orca? Or? Yeah. Oh, it yeah. is? Yes. Oh, okay. so, so, yes. So, you see in captivity, 100% of the adult males, and they're the ones with the really tall dorsal fins, 100% of them are collapsed. 
and that's a combination of all of the horrid things that go on in captivity like um, you know poor water quality stress for the animals poor food yada 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 and in the wild it happens occasionally so less than one percent of the adult males have drooped over dorsal fins but in 99% of those cases, we are able to ascertain that something has happened to that animal. So it's either been hit by a boat or it's been um, entangled in a line or um, it's got some sort of uh, disease like um, pneumonia or something and then its dorsal fin starts to droop. And then usually in the wild, within a year or so, of that happening, the animals are dead. Right. So, yeah. So, if you see it in the wild, they probably don't have too, yeah. well, too much longer well, to live, uh, let's say. Right, right. But that's different than what we see with some of our New Zealand orca that have these funky shaped fins like zigzags. So, we've got an orca called corkscrew and another one called funky monkey, and their <laughs> fin is like a zigzag. And those animals have been around, well, um, corkscrew's been around for 40 plus years and... Um, um, funky monkey is about 33 years now and, and their fins are still that sh funny shape but they are perfectly happy and healthy. We think what's happened there is that they've had an injury, they've managed to recover but there is the, um, if you like, that legacy, that history right. visible in the dorsal fin, yeah. Uh, they must uh, have incredible um, bodily systems, like, like immune systems and things oh, like yeah. that because there's no yeah. health intervention that, well, that... No that I'm aware no, of. There's no, no like doc, Dr. Orca who comes along and <laughs> helps you out, right? You're, everyone's on their own. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And that's why it's so important that we look after our marine environment, right? And don't don't pour things down the drain that get into the ocean and don't throw rubbish into the water And because they haven't got a second chance, you know. They don't get a chance to go to the doctor. But having said that, you know, as you pointed out earlier, they live a long time. We know the females can live to over 100 years and the males typically live to around 60 to 70 years. Well, that's a big, um, that, that's quite a gap. Yeah, it is. Well, the females go into menopause. They're one of the few animals apart from humans that do that. And we believe it's kind of like a, a grandmother thing going on. So the grandmothers, once they're post reproduction, they are still there able to help look after the youngsters and they're also repositories for information. Right. So they've got incredible memories and they might go back when I was a little calf, I remember when there was another marine heat wave and we went here and then we found food and so she's this this knowledge base and so there is value in her being looked after by the community as well when she gets a bit older. Which is kind of like human um family sort of yeah. dynamics isn't it that's yeah. um yeah. Grand, yeah. Grand, grandmothers being sort of more useful than granddads or, or whatever to the group <laughs> well, <laughs> i wouldn't go that far i mean you know we've got to love our granddads as well but you know having said that there is biologically there's a lot of good reasons for the grandmothers to be around because they have um a stronger skill set for raising the kids yeah. Usually. Not always, of course, but usually. So that's kind of where that's coming from. And yeah. are, their numbers, uh, are their numbers good? Um, no. They, oh, no. Really? No, we have, big prob yeah, we have big problems in New Zealand. Um, we've got the highest boat strike rate. Um, that's because of people driving like idiots around the animals trying to get up and get their, you know, their own selfie photos and they don't really care about the animals. Politicians when they're not the at the rugby. <laughs> yeah, and then we have the highest um, rate of entanglement in the world and um, we also have the highest stranding rate and so when you combine all of those together if you don't have the right people out there doing the rescues and helping the animals or if you don't you know, prevent things happening in the first place then you can end up with issues and we have had um, about... 30 animals die in the last 20 years, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you consider there's fewer than 200 orca around the whole of New Zealand, that really? makes a big difference. Is that all? Yeah. Yes. Have we yes. any idea about what the historical numbers were? Or is that the, the, they, the, no. for a predator like that, no. you, at the top, there's only room for so many? How does it work? Well, it's kind of a combination of that. But, um, you know, we've likely had a population of orca that fed on seals very early on, but then when, when um, the sealers came ah, in and they wiped the seals yeah. out so quickly, and because of the culture, the animals literally will starve to death. They don't change their food 
preference. And we're seeing that now in uh, the Pacific Northwest up off the coast of um, Washington and British Columbia, where there's a population of orca that specialise in feeding on salmon. And the salmon are being fished out and those orca, even though there are other orca who feed on marine mammals living in the same area who are doing really well, the salmon eaters are, are um, dying off really fast and there's only 70 of those left, uh, which is really tragic because they're the, the most studied orca population in the world. So here in New Zealand, you know, where every time the new marina goes in, every time there's a new breakwater, every time that there's another... Um, marine farm of some sort going in, then, you know, you're reducing the habitat where the animals can hunt and then you end up with more compromised issues for the animals and then you've got more boats and then you've got more this and more that and it just keeps piling up for them. So, yeah, it's really concerning. Why Why do we always seem to do badly at things like that? I was Here was I thinking that we're probably quite a good... When you're talking about culture and no. the specifics of, yeah. of, of, of animals that live in this area, I was thinking, well, they're probably, they probably don't know, but they're probably lucky to be in this part of the world. You know, it's, but here they are getting tangled up the most and, and, yep. and all, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Oh, look, honestly, most of the time it's coming down to money. Sometimes it just comes down to people being stupid and not caring. But most of the time it's coming down to money. And, and that's a tragic thing that we're putting money ahead of protecting our marine environment. And I've, I've read how there's um, moves to increase aquaculture in New Zealand by a hundredfold in the next 10 years. And we can't even look after the aquaculture that's going on at the moment with the amount of rubbish that's coming up on the beaches and entanglements and stuff like that. So, you know, it, you, it's hard to push back against something like that, but, you know, the public has to recognise that, um, you know, we're not as clean and green and lovely as we like to think that we are. I wonder what they think of us, because they must, with their beeps and sonic uh, <laughs> uh, language, yeah. must talk about us. Um, oh, you'd imagine so. I mean, they, they certainly do recognise individual boats. I mean, I'll have them swim past a bunch of boats and come straight up to my boat because they've, they've known the same boat for decades. Right. Um, they, they know each other very, very well, obviously. And um, it, when, when you look at some of the interactions where you've got animals that have um, been spending a bit of time in, in areas where there is... Um, well, let's call them unusual situations. So there was one orca who got separated from his mum. He was actually kidnapped by another orca. And then, oh. um, yeah, and he was by himself for a little while and he actually started mimicking the noise of, of outboard engines and barking dogs. So, <laughs> yeah, they, they, they certainly can recognise different things in their environment, and which makes sense when they're a top predator, right? Fascinating talking with you. Thanks for taking a bit of time to... Um well, give us some great information. I've learned about a whole bunch of things about orcas uh, uh, just Excellent. in the last few minutes. Well, so thank you for that. No worries, Paul. And you can get lots more information on my website, which is just orcaresearch.org. And there's heaps and heaps of articles, scientific papers, posters, all sorts of things on there. So you can learn lots more. And is there any, just, last question, just curiosity, um, is there any way of explaining the coloration of these animals? I oh, mean, yes. That, yes. Oh, okay, just quickly. Absolutely. Yeah, very quickly. Uh, so the white on the side of the face, we believe, helps them synchronise doing um, coordinated attacks on things. And um, the that pigmentation is actually different for each individual, like a fingerprint. So ah. potentially it's also there to help them recognise each other. Yeah. Oh, of course. All right. Yeah, okay. and Paul, honestly, if you, if you see the orca again or any of your listeners do, we'd love to hear from you. You can call us on 0800 C orca S E E. O-R-C-A. So if you see them, you can call us. All right, Ingrid, thanks so much for coming on the platform. Appreciate it. Thank you. Anytime. Okay. All right, take All right. care now. Okay. Ingrid Bye. Visser uh, from the Orca Research Trust. That's fa fascinating, really, when you think about it. I wonder what political issues they have and how they debate it. So let's pull into this little bay here and have a chat about it. Um, and then afterwards, we'll, we'll have a bit of stingray and agree on... Action points and <laughs> smoke some seaweed. Have a seaweed bong. They probably do have... That was Kelly's idea, by the way. She thought of that. Um, they probably do have, though, things in the sea that they know if they, you know, 
eat a bit of it or... Magic seaweed or something yeah, like yeah, that. Well, yeah, well, of course they would, right? Electric eels? I don't know. <laughs> Let's stay away from them. <laughs> but, you know, like cuttlefish or something, lick it and they get all out of it. Oh, know? yeah. It's got to be some sort of hallucinogenic down yeah. there, right? Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's like licking other whales or something like toads. I don't know. <laughs> I'm backing out of this yeah, conversation. Yeah, yeah, it could be. All right.